Welcome to this video on Pharmacy Foundations. We're exploring common receptors and substrates in the nervous system. By the end, you'll have a clearer understanding of their roles, agonists, and antagonists. Let's get started. First, let's talk about the muscarinic receptor, which uses acetylcholine, ACH, as its substrate. When activated by an agonist, it increases cell UDD, salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, and digestion. Agonist drugs like pilocarpine and bethanicol enhance these functions. On the other hand, antagonists reduce SLUDD, leading to dry mouth, constipation, and other effects. Examples include atropine and oxybutynin, often used for overactive bladder or to reduce secretions. Moving to the nicotinic receptor, this also uses ACH as its substrate. Agonists such as nicotine increase heart rate and blood pressure. Blocking this receptor results in neuromuscular blockade, a process used in surgery to relax muscles. The alpha-1 receptor, which works with epinephrine and norepinephrine, causes smooth muscle constriction and increases blood pressure when activated. Drugs that block this receptor lower blood pressure and relax smooth muscle, making them useful in treating hypertension. Next is the alpha-2 receptor, which also responds to epinephrine and norepinephrine. Agonists here decrease the release of these neurotransmitters, lowering blood pressure and heart rate. Antagonists do the opposite, increasing blood pressure and heart rate by promoting more neurotransmitter release. Now, let's look at beta receptors. The beta-1 receptor works with epinephrine and norepinephrine. Agonists increase myocardial contractility, enhancing heart function. Antagonists, like beta blockers, slow the heart rate and are often prescribed for hypertension. The beta-2 receptor uses epinephrine and primarily acts on the lungs. Agonists cause bronchodilation, helping open airways in conditions like asthma, while antagonists cause bronchoconstriction. Two additional receptors to consider are the dopamine and serotonin receptors, which interact with their respective neurotransmitters. These receptors influence mood, motor control, and other vital CNS functions. Now let's discuss enzymes. The first is acetylcholinesterase, which breaks down acetylcholine. Drugs like donopezil, rivastigmine, and galantamine inhibit this enzyme, enhancing cholinergic activity and aiding conditions like Alzheimer's disease. Next, the angiotensin-converting enzyme, ACE, converts angiotensin I to angiotensin II, which increases blood pressure. ACE inhibitors like lisinopril and ramipril block this process, making them effective for hypertension and heart failure. The COMT enzyme breaks down levodopa, a dopamine precursor. Drugs like entacapone inhibit COMT, prolonging levodopa's effects in Parkinson's disease. Finally, COX enzymes convert arachidonic acid into prostaglandins and thromboxane A2, which mediate inflammation and clotting. NSAIDs, such as ibuprofen, inhibit COX, reducing pain and inflammation. Moving on to monoamine oxidase, which break down catecholamines. Phosphodiesterase, which break down CGMP. Vitamin K epoxide reductase, which converts vitamin K to its active form required for production of select clotting factors. And lastly, xanthine oxidase, which breaks down hypoxanthine and xanthine into uric acid. Next, we will be reviewing drug interactions. Pharmacodynamics are the effects that a drug has on the body. Pharmacodynamics. Drug interactions can occur when two or more drugs are given together. These effects can be additive, antagonistic, or synergistic. Next, an important drug interaction you want to look out for are concurrent use of benzodiazepines and opioids. Due to the heightened fatality risk when opioids and benzodiazepines are taken together, 
the FDA added a boxed warning to all drugs in both classes. Concomitant use of benzodiazepines and opioids may result in profound sedation, respiratory depression, coma, and death. Limit concomitant prescribing of these drugs to patients CEF or whom alternative treatment options are inadequate. Restrict dosages and durations to the minimum required time. Monitor patients for signs and symptoms of respiratory depression and sedation. Pharmacokinetics are effect the body has on the drug as it goes through the ADME processes. Absorption typically occurring in the small intestine with oral drugs. Distribution, which is through the blood and dispersed throughout the tissues. Metabolism, including enzymatic reactions. And lastly, excretion removal of the drug or end products, metabolites, from the body. PK drug interactions occur when one drug alters the ADME of another drug, which is usually either harmful or beneficial. A prodrug is a medication that starts in an inactive or less active form and needs to be converted inside the body to become effective. The body's natural processes, such as enzymes in the liver or other tissues, activate the prodrug, turning it into the active drug that produces the desired therapeutic effect. Her are some medications that are prodrugs and become their active metabolite when metabolized. Capacitabine turns into fluorouracil. Phosphonitoin turns into phenytoin. Primidone turns into phenobarbital. Codeine turns into morphine. Levodopa turns into dopamine. Cholestimethate turns into cholestin. Valacyclovir turns into acyclovir. Cortisone turns into cortisol. Valgancyclovir turns into gancyclovir. Prednisone turns into prednisolone. Famcyclovir turns into pencyclovir. List X amphetamine turns into dextroamphetamine. Enzyme inhibitor. Increase the concentration of substrate drug. You want to remember G Pac Man, which stands for grapefruit protease inhibitors, which are drugs ending in avir, azole, antifungals, which stands for cyclosporine, cobicistat, and cimetidine. Macrolides, which include clarithromycin, erythromycin, but not azithromycin, amiodarone and drondarone, and lastly, the N for non-DHP-CCB, which include diltiazem and verapamil. Enzyme inducers, which decrease the concentration of the substrate drugs. You want to remember PS porks. The D means it decreased the concentration of drug. This stands for primidone, St. John's wort, phenytoin, and phenobarbital. Oxcarbazepine, rifampine, rifabutin, rifapentine, carbamazepine, and smoking. Next, we'll be reviewing lab monitoring. We will be reviewing medications along with their therapeutic range. It's important to memorize these ranges when monitoring patients so you'll know when their medication needs to be adjusted or is at therapeutic levels. First off, we have carbamazepine, which is from 4 to 12 micrograms per ml, digoxin, which is 0.8 to 2 for a fib, and 0.5 to 0.9 for heart failure. For gentamicin and tobramycin, when dosing traditionally, the peak should be from 5 to 10 micrograms per ml, and the trough should be under 2. For lithium, the therapeutic range is 0.6 to 1.2. For phenytoin and phosphonytoin, the range is 10 to 20. If it important to note that if albumin is low when calculating phenytoin, it is important to calculate corrected levels. For procainamide, the range is from 4 to 10. For Napa, the range is 15 to 25. For theophylline, the rance is from 50 to 100. For vancomycin, the trough for serious infections is from 15 to 20, while for other infections that are less serious, the trough is from 10 to 15. And lastly, for warfarin, the INR range is from 2 to 3, but it should be noted that for any patients with a mechanical mitral valve, the range should be from 2.5 to 3.5. Moving on to drug references. It's important for you to know where to locate guidelines for common conditions. Starting off with anticoagulation guidelines. 
These will be found under the guidelines from the American College of Chest Physicians, which is also known as the Chest Guidelines. These review stroke prevention in atrial fibrillation and venous thromboembolism. Next, we have diabetes, which are the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, also known as AACE, and the American Diabetes Association, also known as the ADA guidelines. For pulmonary conditions, we have asthma guidelines, which can be found in the Global Initiative for Asthma, otherwise known as the GINA guidelines, and the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, which is long for NHLBI guidelines. For cardiovascular disease, we have guidelines from the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, ACC, and AHA. These guidelines cover a variety of diseases, which include acute coronary syndromes, atrial fibrillation, high cholesterol, heart failure, and hypertension. For oncology, we have the American Society of Clinical Oncology Guidelines and the National Comprehensive Cancer Network Guidelines. Lastly, we have infectious diseases which can be found under the Infectious Diseases Society of America. Guidelines, HIV and AIDS, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and the Sexually Transmitted Infections Guidelines found on the CDC website. For pregnancy and women's health, we have the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists Guidelines. For psychiatric conditions, we have the American Psychiatric Association, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 5th edition. For renal diseases, we have the Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes. For pediatrics, we have the American Academy of Pediatrics. And for vaccines, we have the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices and Centers for Disease Control. Moving on to color drug references, we have the Orange Book, which is under the FDA. The Orange Book is a list of approved drugs that can be interchanged with generics based on therapeutic equivalents. Pink Book, CDC. Information on Epidemiology and Vaccine Preventable Diseases. Pink Sheet is for news reports on regulatory, legislative, legal, and business developments. Purple Books are a list of biological drug products, including biosimilars. The Red Book is for pediatrics, which consists of summaries of pediatric infectious diseases, antimicrobial treatment, and vaccinations. The Red Book is for pharmacy purposes, where you can look up drug pricing information. The Yellow Book holds information on the Heath risks of international travel, required vaccines, and prophylaxis medications. Lastly, we have Greens Books, which holds information on approved animal drug products. Next, let's move on to drug formulations and patient counseling. Starting off with patch frequencies. Starting off with patches that are worn daily, we have methylphenidate, nicotine, ribostigmine, rotigotine, selegiline, and testosterone. For lidocaine patches, you can wear one to three patches as needed, and they are worn for 12 hours on and 12 hours off. Nitroglycerin patches are on for 12 to 14 hours, then off from 10 to 12 hours. Diclofenac patches are worn twice a day, while fentanyl patches are work every 72 hours. Patches that are worn weekly include Clymara, Xulane, Zafami, Twirla, Adlerity, Butrans, and Cataprys TTS. And lasty patches that are worn twice weekly include Allora, Viveldot, and Oxytrol. Now let's review intravenous medication principles. For drugs with leaching and absorption issues with PCV containers, you should remember leach absorbs to take in nutrients, or you see put use the mnemonic Latin, which should help you remember lorazepam, amiodarone, tacrolimus, taxanes, insulin, and nitroglycerin. Drugs that are incompatible with normal saline are Outrageous Baker's Avoid Salt, which stands for Oxaliplatin, Bactrim, Amphotericin B, and Synersid. Drugs that are incompatible with D5W. For these drugs, you could remember a diabetic can't eat pie. This stands for Ampicillin, Daptomycin, 
infliximab, ampicillin, and sulbactam, caspofungin, ertapenem, and phenytoin. For common drugs with filter requirements, you can remember my gal is Pat, who has a map. This will allow you to remember all the medications that need filtering. Faux medications that do not need to be refrigerated, you can remember, dear sweet pharmacist, freezing makes me edgy. For medications that need to be protected from light during administration, you can remember protect every necessary med from daylight. It's very important knowing these characteristics for each of these medications. This will allow for safe medication use and handling. Now let's review drugs and conditions that alter vital signs. There are several medications that can increase a patient's blood pressure. These include any stimulants, decongestants, NSAIDs, caffeine, cocaine, antidepressants, immunosuppressants, ESAs, steroids, and oral contraceptives. Medications that decrease blood pressure include antihypertensives, vasodilators, opioids, benzos, anesthetics, and phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Drugs that increase patients' heart rate include any stimulants, decongestants, beta agonists, theophylline, anticholinergics, bupropion, antipsychotics, excess caffeine or nicotine, illicit drug use, and vasodilators, which can cause reflex tachycardia. Medications that decrease heart rate include beta blockers, non-DHP CCBs, digoxin, clonidine, guanfacine, antiarrhythmics, opioids, sedatives, anesthetics, neuromuscular blockers, and acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Medications that increase respiratory rate are stimulants, while medications that decrease respiratory rate are opioids and sedatives. And finally, medications that increase patient's temperature include inhaled anesthetics, antipsychotics, and topiramate. Moving on to reviewing how to approach case-based questions. When answering case-based questions, it's very important to try to figure out what the question is actually asking you. When answering case-based questions here are the things you want to look out for. Any untreated medical condition, medications used without indication, improper drug selection, dose too low or too high, therapeutic duplication, lack of patient understanding, drug allergy, drug interaction, improper use of medication, failure to receive medication, adverse drug reaction, and non-adherence.